Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, today's Tech Talk is on writing for translation or world-ready authoring. Our speaker is Bjorn Austrat. Uh, he uh, has a dual degrees in translation and interpretation and taught at the Monterey Institute and has consulted for 15 years to companies uh, doing um, internationalization of their websites, of their software, and documentation. So... Um, Please also remember that this talk is being recorded and save your Google-specific questions till the very end after we stop filming. Thank you, and here's Björn. Good, uh, meine Damen und Herren, es freut mich sehr, Sie heute hier willkommen heißen zu können beim Google Tech Talk. Und es geht um das Thema, wie man für Übersetzung richtig schreibt. Okay? Ja? Yeah? So, how did that feel? Ein bisschen, ja. Yeah. Edelweiss, yeah. Um, so that's what it's like for sometimes for translators or even speakers for, of, a, of a foreign language to consume things that weren't written or designed to be consumed in that language. And even though translators are, of course, highly trained individuals that have degrees and are you know, bilingual as much as you can possibly be bilingual, uh, sometimes it's very difficult for them to understand the source copy because of certain speed bumps that I call them speed bumps, translation speed bumps, that may exist in your collateral or in your documentation, online help, in your user interface. And today's talk, even though Google, of course, is already very world ready because you translate already into dozens of languages and you have 50 or 60 interface languages you can select for the Google search, uh, the main Google search interface, there are still some things that could be finessed a little bit. And so today's talk is not so much about, oh my God, this is horrible and here's, you need to completely change the, what you do. But this is really a, like a coaching session to help you improve slightly on the, on the great work you already are doing. So what is world-ready authoring? It's really about increasing the portability of your output, cultural and linguistic portability. And because in modern high-tech businesses, English is just another language, it does really pay huge dividends to design and author and think about translation before you even write the original. And so this is why uh, the, I, the second bullet point or the sub-bullet point here says, translation starts before you write the original, which seems counterintuitive, but it really becomes clear when you think about translation and localization as an it's not a feature, it's not something you can tack on at the end, it's like an architecture. And if it's not architected into the whole document and, and electronic collateral creation process, it's gonna be very expensive later to fix it. Just like in a house, if you don't put the pipes in at the beginning, uh, or you have to tack on an elevator later, it is usually a lot more expensive than if you had planned for those things in the beginning. So the US English, typically in a, in a multi, in a national, multilingual, global company like Google, has to strike a balance between the hippest possible, ethnocentric, culturally super duper for American audiences version, and a more linguistically portable version, which is taking into account the 20 or 30 or 40 other languages that are still ultimately gonna be consumers of that interface. So it touches really everything, the layout, the composition, the style, the font choices, and so on. And I'll go into much more detail in my presentation on what are some of the elements of world-ready authoring. Well, some of the benefits of world-ready authoring. Well, if you have 40 languages and you fix it once in English, you don't have to fix it 40 times. It's a very simple multiplication math that if you remediate it once, you don't have to then fix it over and over and over again in the translated copy. The translation quality goes up and the source text becomes easier to understand, also for US consumers. Oddly enough, writing for translation, good writing for translation is actually typically good writing in just period. And so how many of you have read Strunk and White? Yeah, old school. Um, Strunk and white, you know, page four, the clarity and conciseness that also benefits translation is, is actually one of the hallmarks of good English writing as well. And one very important, very bottom line centric aspect of writing world ready copy and world ready UIs is that it typically takes about 20 minutes to fix one of those or remediate one of those problems. 
And the 20 minutes accrue by, I have to you know, place a call to the translator, to the engineer, then I have to translate engineering ease into English, and then I have to communicate with the translator what that, was the, what that button label meant, and then get it translated and fixed and updated. And God forbid, it was a UI element, so now I have to retake screenshots. And very quickly, one simple mistake can add up to 20, 30 minutes of fixed time. So even if you have just two per page on a 100-page document in 40 languages, it's actually quite a good change of money to go through that and make it a world-ready copy that you can save by doing that if you do it once at the beginning of the process. Do you all know what a locale is, by the way? Because I mentioned that it's one of those translation technical terms. What's a locale? Which dialect you're using? Because, for example, evolution Spain is not the same as Mexican Spain. Correct. So the answer was that it's a particular code that tells you what language and geographical location this is designed for. So, for instance, Spanish Spanish versus Mexican Spanish. And there's also this great construct that all translators that are really you know, trained translators love, which is North American Spanish. It's just a great it's a construct that doesn't really exist, but for convenience is used to cover the Spanish-speaking population in North America. And if you, I've lived in Los Angeles, there's another language now, it's called Spanglish. And it's, it's truly an emerging language that probably 100 years is gonna be like Dutch, you know, it's just gonna be another language where um, church is, for instance, now translated in Churche, and bakery is the Bacaria. And so things interesting, you know, new language emerging there in Los Angeles. So, I mentioned there's a, quite a few components to world-ready authoring, and one of the really important ones that's gonna get really expensive and hard to fix is layout. So for instance, translated text is almost always longer than the original text. And uh, the text twelve can be between 40 and 300%. This is an actual German word. I looked it up, it's on Wikipedia. You can check this. And it says, Rindfleisch, Etikettierungs, Überwachungs, Aufgaben, Übertragungsgesetz. <clears throat> It starts with beef, yeah, Rindfleisch. Etikettierung is labeling. Überwachung is monitoring. Aufgaben are the tasks. Übertragungs is transfer, and Gesetz is law. And so German is one of those great compounding noun languages that you can make arbitrarily long nouns. And while this is, of course, an extreme example, German words typically are longer than their English originals, and as are Spanish words. So because there are, there's gonna be more words and they're gonna be longer, one of the things that are really hard to deal with is a tightly constrained source space. It could be a button, it could be a tab writer, it could be a columnar layout. And so if you, what's it? Pop-up windows. Pop windows, right? Uh, or the Google box, the, the info box that is constrained by law and the powers that be in marketing that can only be 120 pixels tall. Well, if we cram it full, chuck full of goodies in English, it's likely not gonna fit in the translation. So, another example is map it, landkarte erstellen, or laptop. In some Spanish flavors, that's computadora portátil. So if you had a great little map it button on your Google Maps, and then you do it in German, good luck. And of course, this, this means, um, anybody wants to take a stab at what this means, this long German word? So it's the law governing the, the supervisory tasks regarding labeling of beef. That's pretty much it. So it's the FDA. It's uh, a subchapter of a very, apparently very meticulous German government agency that deals with nothing but supervising how beef gets labeled. And it, there's a law about it, of course. So as an example, I, I went to the Google, the public Google site to look for some examples of where this is actually already in effect today. And um, you can see that this columnar layout here, setting preferences fits nicely in the bulleted form. But then as soon as you translate into German, feststellen, festlegen von Einstellungen, um, it does wrap. And the German words are longer as well. So here it's okay, it doesn't look pretty, but it's okay. Where it's not okay is if it starts to have a constraint space and gets truncated, which happens sometimes in user interfaces that are not entirely HTML or web-centric. For instance, on a regular Windows dialog box, 
If you chop off a piece of a word, you could change the meaning. And so then this becomes a real problem. By the way, a lot of the examples are German, not because the German translation team is doing a poor job, it's because it's my native language, so I felt most comfortable selecting examples from that interface. So here's some recommendations, because it's always easiest to say, don't do this, but obviously you can't prove a negative. So here's some of the things that you should do, if possible, which is to avoid a narrow or columnar layout. It aids the eye reading online. That's why the columns are used in web, on the web especially, because it's a lot easier to read a narrow column on a screen than it is a wide text that just scrolls across. This is also the main reason why large format newspapers use a columnar layout, because it guides the eye and makes reading faster. However, in translation, it becomes more difficult. So you should assume that uh, for a column width, that you would go probably typically 60% wider than you would have in English to accommodate other languages. And you can quickly try this out by simply going to a German newspaper website, cutting and pasting a chunk of text into your layout, and see how many words wrap. In translation, it will hyphenate. The, the translators will be able to hyphenate. But if you just have a sea of hyphens, it's also not very pretty. So a, a quick and dirty uh, trick is to just cut and paste text from a German website or from a German Google site and see what that does to the word wrapping. If it wraps in the middle of a word, it's typically going to be hyphen ultimately and not, not super great layout. So white space is another very important thing, especially if one-to-one -one page correspondence is important, which sometimes it is because you're going to produce a, a manual that is four or five languages. They all have to be on the same page layout, the same page breaks, so the graphics don't get messed up. So if you don't leave enough white space, this will never happen, and it's going to be very expensive layouting that has to happen to make that fit. And especially size-sensitive collateral, quick start guides, package inserts, spines of books, spines of boxes, spines of a Google appliance. And I know that you put text on these sometimes, right? So very, very important that you consider that this is going to be, if it gets localized or translated, that you do have enough room for the, without an excessive amount of wrapping. And buttons and UI elements, of course, the worst offenders, because buttons have a really hard time growing. In typographical conventions, one thing that English native speakers like to use a lot is capitalization for effect. Safe search, personalized search, et cetera, right? Safe search is not only capitalized, it's spelled together in what is known among coders as the Hungarian or sometimes known the Pascal notation. And so if you see variable names sometimes, you see somebody writing int and then you know, some uppercase letter and so on, that means typically it's a variable of the type integer. And so for convenience, people like to glue those words together, capitalize the important words, and that has a special effect because it creates the effect of a trademark or a branded name. Of course, in Asian languages, and with some native speakers here, there is no capitalization because it's, they're ideographic languages, right? So they just use the character symbols. So that is lost entirely. Also, if there's no spaces between words, then putting two words together doesn't make a whole lot of a difference. Also, small font sizes may make characters really a lot more difficult to read than they are in English. For example, you see the first example, the first bullet point here? You have the regular A, then you have an umlaut A with the two dots on it, and then you have an ideographic character, which I have no idea what it means. Does anybody, can anybody translate what that character means? Help. Help. I must have cut and pasted that from the website. So. At the same font size, note how it is a lot easier to read the regular, the English letter. The umlauts are a little bit harder to make out. And then the Asian character is almost illegible because it's smudged. It's a dense ideographic character. So I have to go up in the font size to make the Japanese or Chinese legible. And uh, one second. And uh, I can keep a smaller font size. So now imagine if you had densely packed small text in English. It's going to get 40% longer after translation, and I have to bump up the font size by one click to make it legible. So now I have a real text file problem, right? Because now I'm going to have suddenly two pages worth of stuff 
and I have one page to fit it on. Unless I want to use the you know, pharma pharmacological package insert font 0.6 with a reading glass for free. Yes? Is there any specific minimum size font that uh, should be using? Is there a specific minimum? F I need to repeat the question for the audio. So the question was, is there a specific minimum size font? And the answer is no, because it depends on the language. But I would experiment with, as a layouting person who creates the original, I would experiment with different languages to see if the legibility is maintained at that font size. And if not, leave more white space. Because then ultimately, one of the devices that the foreign language DDP person may have, that's the publishing person may have, is to increase the font size to make it legible. So it's just something to keep in mind as part of the world-ready authoring approach. Yes? Is bold generally used for emphasis in character-based languages, or is it not used? Is bold used for emphasis in character-based languages? It is used. And it is uh, sometimes quotation marks are also used, and underlining are used. On the web, Underlining carries a special meaning, as in, I'm a link. So that's a problem, right? But bolding is usually a safer thing to do because it will carry well into languages that are not using the capitalization or where you cannot use capitalization because it's meaningful, like German. And italics are pointless. Italics are sometimes pointless. In Asian languages, typically, italics are used for different cultural contexts, such as comics. And so emphasis, which is in, in, in English, italics in, indicate emphasis, may indicate a total cultural shift or an inappropriate cultural shift in, in some Asian locales. So it's a, it's a tricky device to use. So here are some examples from the Google website. Uh, what is personalized search? It's capitalized here for effect because it's a, a particular feature of Google. And in German, that is, effect is entirely gone because now Personalisierte Suche is a regular adjective. It's not capitalized. And uh, if I write that in its German translation, I would never know that personalized search is a feature that you want to draw attention to, because that capitalization is really what that does. It draws attention to this word. Uh, so how, how would you suggest that the translator deal with that in the other languages? That's a, so the question was, what, how would you deal with that in other languages? And the, the, there are multiple ways to deal with it. For instance, bolding a different font type, which is also tricky in Asian languages, as you can imagine. And uh, if it's a trademarked term, uh, you may capitalize both words to indicate that this is a noun phrase that belongs together and it's a trademarked term. If it's not trademarked, then of, you can't use that symbol, of course. And it's, it's a tricky issue. It's, a, it's usually a marketing decision, what is done with that, how important is it? Because also, if you, pers if you capitalized the P here, it would draw attention to itself, maybe unnecessarily so. Because it would be, it, by, on its face value, it would be a typographical mistake. If it's not a trademark term, capitalizing the P here is wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a hard, hard and fast error. Correct. So some recommendations again. Scaling font sizes to work well with accented characters is one important uh, important consideration. If you, can't, if you don't want to do that or can't in English, just leave enough white space or use some of the other tools in your arsenal to deal with the very, very likely text swell that will occur. Quotation marks and bolding were feasible. Because bolding carries well. But again, keep in mind, if you have small Asian text and you bold it, it becomes illegible. So you need to scale it up a little bit. And if you want to do yourself a favor, avoid creative fonts. I did one uh, project in a past life uh, when I was working for Pulitzer Translation Services, and we localized the, the Timon and Pumbaa CD-ROM games. Timon and Pumbaa was the Jungle King, you know, many moons ago, and they used a great and clever font called the Timon and Pumbaa Jungle font, which was all grubs and leaves and sticks and things like that. Of course, it didn't contain a single umlaut. So there we sat in Fontographer for weeks and made umlaut dotted o's and you know, strike throughs and enyes and things like that out of grubs and trees <laughs> to, to get that localized properly. Coconuts. Coconuts, yeah. Well, it, you know, there are so many foreign characters. If you ever want to see what's really in each font, go to your start button and type on, on run, type char map, and then scroll down, and you'll be surprised how many different characters there are that you need to recreate uh, from coconuts and trees and grubs uh, to get something localized. Yeah, down in the internationalization section, they have a printout of all the extended character sets. And it's something like 15 or 20 feet long and 3 feet high. It's 
really worth looking at. Yeah. yeah, and the reason why Unicode fonts are so large is because they contain every single one of those characters. Arabic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Every possible accented characters, strike throughs, you know, every possible mutilation to a character that you can imagine is in there. Now, a very, very, very important topic, near and dear to my own heart, glossarization. And this is one of the core ways you can influence translation speed as a technical author. A document, by and large, cannot be translated until it comes with a glossary. Okay, very important. You cannot just look it up. That if you ever say that, catch yourself and say, no, oh, I learned that. You can't just look it up in a dictionary or online. You can't even Google, just Google it. Why? Well, because without context, words have no meaning. Very little meaning. Or many, many possible different meanings, which is even worse for a translator. And for example, the word set. Just a, a, a small sample of all the different ways you could translate the word set into Spanish. It could be un juego, if it's golf clubs. Bataria, if it's kitchen utensils. Cubierto, colección, servicio, estuche, dentadura, set of teeth. So you can imagine that this is just a subset. Because set is like looking up Smith in the phone book. Pages and pages and pages of translations. Time, depending again on the context, right? What time is it? Wie spät ist es? How much time does it take? Wie lang dauert es? How many times did something occur? We often finish this Stadt. So imagine you're a poor translator at 6 p.m. on Friday, and somebody's dumping a, a translation task on your desk of string tables. Have you, do you know what string tables are? String tables are basically all the words that belong to a piece of software, and sometimes they pull all of those out into one separate file. And so now here you are sitting trying to translate the word time or set. Well, it's impossible. Example, glossaries are also great for translating the same word consistently over time. And I found this particularly delightful example. So we have the Startseite, which is translated as home. This is both alive right now on your website, by the way. Uh, Google Hilfe is Suchhilfe, or Google Hilfe, that's help. Suchgrundlagen is Grundlagen. Erweiterte Suche is Verfeinerte Suche. And viele Wege führen zu Google, mehr Weg zu Google. That's actually wrong. Google is a noun. Sorry, verb, a verb. They're using Were? Mehr Weg zu Google. More ways to Google. Yes, so they're using it as a verb. Mm, uh, is, it, is it supposed to be a verb in English? No. No, it's, it, this could be a noun. Okay. Yeah. Alle Wege führen nach Rom is the, is the standard German, all, all roads lead to Rome. So it is, it is a noun. So, but as you can see, even if you have the best translators in the world, which I'm sure you do, over time, there are so many different ways you could translate the same word in different ways that a hard glossary becomes a real control on creativity and a welcome control. Because this is confusing ultimately, because I click, this is literally clicking back and forth between two pages and getting two different nav bars. Yeah, these are, uh, this is one link, one, one click away, these two. Yes? I'm a little bit confused about how we create a robust glossary if I have to define what the word set means. Does that mean almost <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. Glossarization recommendations, yes. So here's some recommendations how to make a good glossary. Include all, any and all, companies and industry and product specific terms, even if you think they are absolutely obvious. Because one thing that is not obvious is that as soon as you work at any place, not just Google, any place for more than a week, you will start to wear that, that place's verbal uniform. And verbal uniforms work like this. They are used as a social marker. If you speak a lot of technical terminology that only your peers understand, it raises your social standing. You may have noticed this in talking to some people. Um, especially if you know a lot of acronyms. These are like medals on the verbal uniform. And uh, it's great it, as a, it, it basically accelerates communication. It has its place. Doctors talk in technical jargon amongst each other because it's more efficient to communicate this way. 
They can say this particular nerve, Latin word, instead of saying, well, the nerve you know, that runs from here and all the way down to here and comes out of your ankle, because that's not very efficient. However, as soon as you leave your social group, then it becomes manipulative or ineffective. And so my favorite sentence when I ever ask a technical person to explain something to me is to say, in a language a 12-year-old could understand, and in 25 words or less, what is a compiler? And that makes great glossary entries, if you set it up like this, mentally. So since we have a little bit of time, in a language a 12-year-old could understand, and in 25 words or less, what is a compiler? Anybody want to venture a definition? Yes? It translates the language a human can understand, or some humans, into a language that computers can understand. That's great, that's a great definition. That's a very good definition. And that makes sense, right? It's like a translation device. And my grandma asked me this question a few years ago, and she loved baking, so I said, it's like an oven, and you take the ingredients for a program, and you bake them, and what comes out is still the same ingredients, but it has different functions now. So a compiler is like an oven, which made perfect sense to my grandma. So depending on your target audience, coming up with a good glossary definition is hard, but it's a huge time saver. Because that, those translators will not call you and will not waste hours and hours and hours doing terminology research when they could be translating. Yes? Given your baking example, are you going to talk about idioms and metaphors? Yes. So include all A's, I's, and A's, acronyms, abbreviations, and initialisms. Very, very, very important. Try looking up DB in, a, in an acronym dictionary. Again, like Smith in the phone book. Lots and lots of different meanings. Decibel, database, and so on and so forth. Down in Bradstreet. There are many, many possible meanings for DB, even in the same context. And at the very least, a glossary has to have four columns. A source term, a target term. You can leave that blank because nobody's expecting you to actually find the translation for that term. But when you submit a glossary for translation, it should contain the source term. Which part of speech is it? Very important. Remember the set example or the time example? Is that a noun, verb, adjective, pronoun, noun phrase, none of the above? And a comment field. And that the comment field is where you can spend four hours writing comments for a glossary and save yourself, per language, 20 hours times 40 languages. Real big bang for the buck. This should be making, making a glossary, a robust glossary, should be part of your translation process, which I'm sure it already is. But it's the responsibility of the source authoring team to really contribute to that process. The translation team will create a glossary, but you can really make it a lot better and more useful by contributing to that process. There was one question in the back there. So just to be clear, this glossary is specifically for the translation team, not for the, the uh, target audience of the document. Good question. So the question was, is this specifically for the translation team or for the target audience? Both. Because the target audience benefits tremendously from a good glossary. So it seems to me that probably if your target audience is a uh, developer, you probably don't need to be trying to compile it for them. Cor correct. So the, it, again, the, the, the question was, does the target audience influence what goes into the glossary? Yes, it does. So the most expansive possible version of the glossary will be for the translation team and for a novice audience, let's say. Somebody just bought Google Mini and wants to just plug it into the network, and they may need to look up what the you know, feeds protocol is. And is that its own word, and what does that mean? Even, th even though they just bought the search appliance and they are moderately technical, just not in your way. You had a question? question. Okay. Now, to your earlier point, of course, translation is not just replacing words, as you well know, because otherwise machines could do it and they still kind of suck at it. But we've been away from perfect machine translation for 10 years now, since the 1950s. So that's, you know, we're making progress. We're still 10 years away. And there's a lot of cultural content as well that, that influences and profuses language. For instance, if you simply say the word Super Bowl, you, most people in this room would know what that is, right? And what, what are all the things that pertain to it? What are some of the words that go with Super Bowl? Football, championship, snacks, barbecue, party, point spread, very good. 
booze, you know, et cetera, right? So the Super Bowl is a cultural institution and a, and a sports game, but if you say, I, want, I went to a Super Bowl party, that means a lot that you don't have to explain because you all share in the same culture. Of course, if you're in a culture that for some bizarre reason doesn't have to game of football, not in that forum, they played with a smaller ball and it's round and you know, the soccer thing that's going on right now, then adding something that's culturally relevant is gonna really cause a huge translation problem. The World Series is the same thing. Do you remember the Subway Series? This was a few years ago, where two teams from New York played each other in the World Series, but you could go between the two stadiums using the subway, so not so much world in a, in a technical sense of the word. Um, constructions like great move not. You're not using those, I'm just saying don't. Potluck party, what does that entail? That that's everything from suburban living to the particularly informal way that Americans interact with each other. So potluck party, a simple, straightforward word. You, if you had to explain to somebody who has never been to the United States, you could spend easily a few pages explaining what that is. Hang 10, et cetera, et cetera. So even straightforward words like school can mean many different things. School in Austria, for instance, is a lot more about academics. And there's no school sports. There's this caste system of jocks and cheerleaders doesn't really exist like that. Clothing is less relevant. After school activities are practically non-existent. While in the United States, the high school is just the focal point of the social life for most, for most people growing up. And also take into account that when you translate something, you also have to take into account legal and technical requirements of other business cultures. For instance, here's an example of what is, why is it that you can get the number of steps in the Statue of Liberty in under a second but waste too much time and so on and so forth. So of course when I translate that, I would have to take something that is relevant to my target audience that is maybe different from the example of the Statue of Liberty because that's a uniquely American example. Not the end of the world, and this is, you know, a professional translator will know what to do because they're trained in doing this very specific task. I'm just saying that this is another one of those tiny speed bumps that's gonna slow down the translation process a little bit. And here's an example of, these are, this is a legal disclaimer that has to do with intellectual property, and it's a good translation, it's accurate. What I don't know without being a lawyer, a German or Austrian lawyer, is does this mean anything legally in that target audience? I don't know. Maybe this is uh, reasons for a lawsuit. Because I now violated a statue of free information sharing from 1869, you know, I don't know. So again, translation is a lot more than replacing words. Even if you're the perfect legal translator, in this way, in this particular place, you would need to culturalize it as well. Here are some of the worst offenders of translation speed bumps. They're called modifier strings. For instance, I'll give $20 to the person who can tell me, tell me unambiguously what the first bullet point means. Got it right here? $20. Anybody? What does that mean? Yes, volunteer? Programs that work faster. Programmers that work faster. Or could it be faster programs? Is it developing faster or are the programs faster? What's that? Accelerated applications don't make any sense. Accelerated applications? Well, yes, yes, they do. if programs run faster, that'd be a good thing, right? I'll have to keep those, sorry. <laughs> Relational database index schema, that's one of yours. Enterprise performance management software solutions, great. But my favorite is from an actual government report, and the government is the worst offender when it comes to acronyms, initialisms, and technical jargon, followed closely by engineers. Um, the commission was impressed by that. This is an actual, not made up example, but a test project command module reaction control system engine oxidizer vapor inhalation damage recovery results. <laughs> Translate. The best dictionary in the world, plus Google, will not do you any good in this. This is not translatable as it is. Sometimes it's unclear. The modifier strings are shorter, but they are loosely correlated in the text, such as, you must send the art typography and color specifications to us. So are the specifications modifying the art typography and color, or just the color? We've striven to integrate system development and sales and support personnel on a global level. Again, non-translatable as it is. So what do you do with these? You write them so they're clear in English. Yes. 
and we'll get there in a second. Um, another, another problem with getting things out of context is that sometimes words are spelled the same, but they don't mean different things because they're either homonyms or homographs, meaning they're pronounced differently but spelled the same, or they mean different things. For instance, set, we already saw the example with the set. Um, searching the database is an example of something that out of context is very difficult to understand what that means. Is it a message, a status message, I'm searching the database right now, or is it a chapter that tells me how to search the database? Searching the database, here's how you do it in four, four easy steps. Record or record have different meanings depending on how it's pronounced, but of course on paper or in electronic format you don't know what that is. Telegraphic English, empty database. Does that mean I'm supposed to empty the database? The database is empty. And invisible plurals. In Spanish, I would need to know how many servers are in a rack. Because otherwise I can't translate it. As I would in, well, German, I could just make one of those great compound nouns and let the user figure it out. Program update, how many programs are getting updated? Database update, in your case, how many databases are actually getting updated? Because the translation would be different depending on if it's a singular database or plural. Yes? Can you explain more what you mean by telegraphic? Right, so I'll actually get to that on the next slide. It's basically you've left out a key word, either the database is empty or how to empty the, the database. And so now I cannot translate this out of context because I won't know what the intent was, right? Here's a great example from your website. Google Search Appliance Feeds Protocol Developer's Guide. Specifying sculpting radius values. Food for thought. So how do you solve these guys? And this is, again, a great benefit to your English users as well. Um, for example, accelerated development of applications to our first example, the $20 example. Or if it's not, no, that, if that's not what's meant, then obviously you can just reshuffle it. Google Search Appliance, Developer's Guide for the Feeds Protocol. Is that right? Is that what is meant to be said there in the previous, in the previous noun phrase? Yeah. It's, that's right. So look, we incurred almost no text swell, just a little bit. But it's a lot clearer in English as well. Translation comments is another huge time saver, especially if you do have to export stuff into string tables or into some disembodied form. Adding a little comment marker, like button, label here, and it means save, makes this word instantaneously translatable. What's wrong with searching the database? What's wrong with, nothing. Then how is it a puzzle? It resolves, by doing this, you resolve the puzzle of searching database. The, the puzzle is searching database, which could mean how to search the database, or I am searching the database right now, and by either using one of those two forms, it becomes immediately clear what this sentence means. Searching database, not so much. And this is also, it's basically this technique, expanding an uh, elliptical English from going from empty database to database is empty, while you have sacrificed four characters, two spaces and is, you've added a lot of meaning. And glossarizing invisible plurals, very, very important. Server rack contains one or more servers. Okay, no problem. Program update, updates three programs that maintain the database, for instance. Last but not least, um, graphical elements are innocuous, and I, I showed this to uh, the slideshow to Joanna before I presented it here, and she said, what's wrong with the mailboxes? And absolutely nothing is wrong with the mailboxes except those are bread boxes in France. <laughs> because mailboxes don't look anything like that in Europe, right? And great, Gmail is not using mailboxes anywhere. It's all the envelope symbol, which is universal, which is a, good, a great use of iconographic design that is culturally portable. This means A-OK, -okay. anybody from Brazil here? It means something slightly different in Brazil, like really bad. <laughs> in a World Cup, yeah. Great job, uh, striker for the other team. Um, <laughs> What's wrong with the yin and yang symbol? What does it mean in this country? Here. Yoga studio? <laughs> Something like that? Meditation, you know. But it's, a, it's actually a pretty significant religious symbol. 
to Buddhist people. So using that frivolously might not be the most culturally portable thing to do. The mailbox is where you talked about. This means stop in American English. It means hi in Iraqi Arabic. This means come here in Thailand. This means victory. This means something like this <laughs> in England. And the Red Cross and Red Crescent, they have a problem now because now the Israelis have wanted to have a Red Star of David for a long time, but the, nobody could agree to that. So they're actually going to change their symbol now to a red diamond, which is going to be the universal symbol for Red Cross and Red Crescent. And then you can put your own cross or crescent inside per, light, per country. But they had to come up with a culturally portable symbol so people wouldn't be offended. If you write somebody's name in, in Korea in red, that means that they're either dead or you wish them dead. So that might not be the best thing to do. And green in Arabic speaking countries, of course, are religious color. And I've checked this. I went to Al Jazeera and I hope the Homeland Security Department is not on, on my trail now. But I went to several Arabic speaking websites to see, and they also use green in their user interface. And I, since I don't speak Arabic, I couldn't find out if that was always with a religious context. It's just something to keep in mind that it might be religiously connoted. Have somebody check it, make sure it's okay. So for instance, here's some examples from the Google interface. Of course, Google is famous for its seasonally appropriate Google logos, and there's no reason whatsoever to stop those. I'm not suggesting that. It's just an, a great example of a culturally specific iconographic design. And I know that the Google Austria has different symbols depending on their holidays in Germany and so on. Yes? Yeah. Is there any safe color? I mean, are there any safe colors? No. No. There, are, there aren't any safe colors. Black, gray, and white. But white means death, too. You know, white lilies and so on. So there aren't really any safe colors. And this is an example from uh, this was, I think, SketchUp, uh, where roads or Google Maps, I, I forgot, uh, where the road symbol looks like an American highway sign. And of course, that wouldn't mean much to a user of a foreign culture. And very, very importantly, concatenation. Have you ever seen things like that or, or written them worse? Unable to do something with something. Unable to move the directory, generate the report, delete the file. Very efficient in English because you just plug in words. Of course, it doesn't work at all in foreign languages because the gender of the report might be masculine, so now the other words have to change to fit that. So anytime you see concatenated sentences like that, assume as a default position they will not be translatable. And they will cause huge rework and pain and suffering in the translation department and in the engineering department because you will have to rewrite your code and that's expensive. Concatenation. concatenation is, for instance, I will have a, a table of words like move, generate, delete, update. And I have, a, I have another table of words called record, file, report, directory. And then I'll stick them into this template as needed. And I'll say, take the sentence template, unable to foo something bar. I'm able to move the directory, delete the file, update the record. And, and because I have so many different possible permutations with eight words, I can make eight factorial permutations. It's a great time saver in English, and it's an absolute translation killer. Because it does not translate, period. Your report. Right. You have to, may have to change the location. Other words may have to change because now it's a different article because it's suddenly the noun is masculine, not feminine, and so on and so forth. Another great time saver is your reports are being printed or your report is being printed. If, you, know, you see this all the time. If count less than one, you know, don't put an S there. Of course, in German, not so much. So here are some recommendations for concatenation. Avoid it. Definitely avoid it. Do not concatenate words into strings, and evil companies use concatenation, which Google is not, right? There are ways around it. For instance, you could make it slightly less slick in English by saying number of reports printed, X. That is translatable, no problem. Because I've taken pieces from within a sentence that are meaningful and have isolated them into one meaningful unit and a variable. So that is translatable. If you ever want to really get somebody, some translator's blood boiling, ask them if, they, if you should concatenate. You will get the good response. So here, uh, in conclusion, some interesting translation facts. It often takes as long to translate something as it did to write the original. And 
to you as technical writers, this may not be very shocking, but to some managers, it's flabbergasting. Why, don't you just sit there and like a parrot, you know, just type it in a foreign language? No. As a technical writer, did you just sit there and write it in English? Well, you, you don't type fast, huh? It takes you a whole day to do a single page? Slow typists, all of you? No, because technical writing is different from just typing it, right? And translation is different from just typing it in a foreign language. Translation resources typically translate about 2,500 words at most a day. You can do more if it's really at the end of a large translation project and you have already totally assimilated the glossary and you're totally in a flow. But by and large, count on being about 2,000, 2,500 words. Optimized source text reduces the number of occurrences tremendously of these translation speed bumps that take up to 20 minutes to fix. And nobody in the world, will, including yourself, will ever read the text as carefully as a translator. Because they have to understand every single sentence. No user, no boss, no reviewer, no editor will ever read your text as carefully as a translator. So they can be your allies, and by making their life better and easier, they will be able to be more productive, which obviously helps Google as a company. Translation is a complex and creative process, and it's, it's well beyond just looking up words, which we explored a little bit of that today. And the number of qualified translators is actually quite tiny. How many translators do you think there are in the United States? Professional, you know, certified translators? 5,000? 5, More? 5,000 would be a lot less than oral surgeons. There are actually a lot less than oral surgeons. Yeah, it's, it's the American Translators Association, I think, has about 13,000 members. It's not a whole lot. And there are other translators that are not members, but it's a really small number. Typically, translation is a training that's between two and four years plus experience, and people work constantly to keep their languages fresh. It's a highly, I taught translation at the Monterey Institute. I can tell you there's a reason why there is a two year graduate program to become a translator. There's a lot to learn in addition to having two languages, okay? And that's pretty much it. Any questions? No, no questions? Yes? So the question was, do you, do you avoid idioms and metaphors? Some. And I would avoid idioms and metaphors if they have no apparent translation, such as something that is so uniquely cultural, like Super Bowl or Potluck or World Series, that it's gonna, be, it's gonna take a translator's footnote this big to explain. If it's a standing phrase like early bird catches the worm, there is a great German and Spanish and Japanese translation for that. It's gonna say something entirely different, but the meaning is gonna be, it's gonna be possible to carry the meaning across. So no, you don't have to make your source text so bland as to avoid all references to something cultural. You may wanna glossarize it and you may wanna draw the translator's attention to it, what you meant to say with this metaphor. What is it that you really want to communicate by saying Super Bowl or the bottom of the ninth and the bases are loaded? Which, if you're not from a country that plays baseball, doesn't mean much, right? So it's not, it's not an, I'm not advocating making the text blander, but just keep it in mind that this is going to be something that's going to bubble up in a translation process and needs to be handled and managed. But it's okay because these are professionals. Mm -hmm.